Welcome to this edition of Talking Markets. I'm Michael Wilson and I'm joined by my good friend and respected city commentator, David Buick. Good, good morning. Again. Bad luck. Welcome. Good morning. <laughs> and uh, very pleased to say we're joined by, um, by Robert Pickering, who, um, well, a distinguished city career, corporate lawyer. Then, of course, there was Casanova. Now there's Marex. I grew up at a time, he, he's only slightly older than me, <laughs> only slightly, um, w when th there were, there were it, was, it was as if there was a satellite over the city and the Japanese banks came and the Americans mm. came and the rest of it. And at the time, I remember thinking, I wonder how those two cultures actually mix. Did you, did you find it was difficult to mix your particular culture or the Casanova culture with the, with the United States, the Americans? Well, yeah, I mean, obviously much later we had that issue in spades with J.P. Morgan, but at the time, that sort of early North Forties phase. I mean, the whole city was becoming, the whole, the whole culture, culture and the way the, the city did business was becoming Americanized. Because if you remember, all through the mid '90s, you had the so-called second barrel of big bang. So you had the original UK conglomerates. You know, the kind of Warburgs, Nowest Markets, yeah. Pizza W. I mean, one by one, they threw in the towel and sold out to sometimes American, sometimes European banks, but even if they were European banks, actually the business culture, the investment bank culture was an American culture, and very often the people were American running them. But the issue we had at Casanova is that we, we prided ourselves on being brokers. And the sort of mantra was, we're brokers, we're not investment bankers. And that was all fine, but actually as the city, as, as the, the configuration of firms in the city changed, all the, I mean, this very rigid split between yeah. merchant banks on the one hand and brokers on the other started to break down, and they all wanted to form these so-called integrated houses. So it always seemed to me, from really quite a young age, um, that what we that sticking to our, uh, you know, we are brokers um, uh, philosophy risk missing out on the, the really lucrative opportunity, which is to build our advisory business yeah. and essentially our M&A advisory business on the back of our enormous list of corporate clients. So this became a kind of quasi-religious debate within the firm for a few years until eventually. The external environment changed to the point where everyone felt, yes, this is something we have to do. What sort of state do you think the City of London is in? Are you concerned the fact that even com companies like London Tunnel ends up going for a Mickey Mouse flotation of 130 million quid in Amsterdam, when the London Stock Exchange should have gobbled it up? I mean, it's yeah. just ridiculous. C clearly, the, the, the confidence of the city is, is pretty low at the moment. and. You know, most of the problems uh, that the city faces uh, are to do with the fact that there's a deal drought at the moment. There's yep. an IPO drought and there's an issuance drought. The machine has to fire on all cylinders and at the moment it's not. So there's a lot of self-reflection going on at the moment. A lot of the problems in the city are to do with the fact that pension funds have withdrawn from investing in UK equities. You've got regulation and governance, all of which have acted as disincentives to, to firms to, to IPO in, in London. There was a very influential paper, I'm sure you know, published by, in fact it was published by the Tony Blair Institute, but written predominantly, I think, by Michael Torrey at um, uh, Ondra Partners, talking about this de-equitization on the part of pension funds and the solution that they're proposing is consolidation of pension funds into, say, into a larger pool of money which is available to invest in the UK. And the interesting thing is the Labour Party has put out a document, I think it's called Investing for Growth or something like that, about their plans for the city. And quite a lot of it is clearly cut and paste from the Michael Tory the report. report yeah. So it, well, that suggests to me that the, at least the examination of these issues is going to be something which is a sort of cross-party consensus, which I think is a good thing. So I think there is some chance that those, those factors will help turn it around. James, people bitch and moan about the City of London. When mm. it comes to foreign exchange and derivatives, we are the kings. And it's really nice to be able to see that. Going back uh, to your IPO and the NASDAQ, is that the reason again, that the NASDAQ has its tentacles out of so many other avenues of investors, which gives you the kind of uh, shareholder register that you want and the blend that g gives you the stability and the liquidity for the stock. Is, yeah. is that fair well, or not? Well, I don't but, want to yeah, embarrass I mean, you or go into any no, detail. No, 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 no. I mean, the main, re the, the main reason we IPO'd on NASDAQ this time was that we now operate, I mean, as, as I said, if 10 years ago we would have called ourselves a commodities broker. We yeah. now call ourselves a diversified financial services platform. And as I say, our main business is clearing, and therefore we operate in an area which is more sort of financial services infrastructure. And it's a sector which has very few quoted peers in this country. And um, 
very few analysts yes. who actually understand the business. Robert Pickering, thank you very much indeed. Thank you so much. Thank Enjoyed every minute you. of it. Thanks so much. <laughs> okay. And that's the end of this edition of Talking Markets. Uh, do join us again soon.